going beyond the headlines. Asking the questions you want answered. Exploring government policies and how they impact you. We are delving deeper. Good evening and welcome to Delving Deeper. I am your host, Ayana Carter. Joining us this evening is Minister of Public Utilities, the Honorable Marvin Gonzalez. Good evening, Minister Gonzalez, and welcome back to the show. Good evening, Ayana. It's always a pleasure to be on the show. It's perhaps my fourth appearance it, it probably is yes yeah. you've been you've been here a lot that's because you have a lot to talk about of course and this this episode is no different of course looking so, forward to it yeah we have a lot to talk about in terms Engaging of the utilities the oh, yes yeah, a lot is happening there under your purview well, thank you so, very much Let's start with TSTT. Uh -huh. So we've had the cyber attack in October last year, um, the departure of the CEO, Lisa Agard, and Ms. Agard is on record stating that she actually did not resign. Um, we have the GSE meeting and all of that, you know, came out in the GSE meeting. And for some time, you've really ha you have not really spoken too much about it. Um, are you prepared to talk about that today? No, um, just to say that I gave a comprehensive um, explanation and a statement to the parliament on some communication issues that arose um, from that cyber attack. Information going into the public domain that um, subsequently would have proven to be not entirely correct, which um, led to the Minister of Public Utilities um, having to read into the records of Parliament, to correct the records of Parliament, as well as to trigger an investigation into the facts and the circumstances uh, surrounding the, the cyber attack. The, the Parliament, you know, comprises of a lot of committees, um, the lower house, the, the upper house, senators, independent senators, um, government senators, joint select committees, with all with responsibility for different aspects of governance in Trinidad and Tobago. The Joint Select Committee on State Enterprises is looking at um, some aspects of TSTT's operations surrounding the cyber attack. Those committees are independent, and therefore it would be imprudent of me as Minister of Public Utilities to comment on public statements um, that, uh, that were made um, before the, the Joint Select Committees. We also have to, um, to, to realize that committees sit in public as well as they sit in private. And what you hear in public is not the whole picture. There are a lot that is happening behind the scenes in camera sittings, that you call them. And um, I'm not a member of the, the Joint Select Committee on State Enterprises. I respect the work. I look forward to the outcome. I'm hoping that their deliberations will lead to some fruitful and insightful recommendations to strengthen our telecommunication sector, especially in this um, era of cyber security and what have you. So um, I will not comment on, on, on anything that, that is being said before the Joint Select Committee. Safe to say that I look forward to the, the, the outcome of their work, um, as well as the report of the independent investigation that I triggered. And once that, those, those reports are, are in, then I will make comments as might be deemed appropriate. Okay. Now, you expressed your willingness to uh, possibly appear before the Joint Select Committee. Is that still something that you are considering? Of course. I mean, if I am the Minister of Public Utilities. I, I want the Joint Select Committee to, to produce a report with all of the facts and the evidence um, surrounding this very unfortunate um, attack on... TSTT as well, and by extension, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And if the Joint Select Committee is of the view that as Minister of Public Utilities, I can assist it in understanding everything that occurred so that it can make reasonable recommendations to the government and to the parliament, then I am more than prepared to do that. As I've said, I, I would have laid in parliament a comprehensive report. I'm sure the Joint Select Committee would have, have possession of that statement that I place on the hands of. But if the, the committee is of the view that I can assist it further, 
then I am prepared to go before it. There's absolutely nothing that, that I have to hide. I have no interest in this matter. See if to see that um, I, am a I am the guardian of the public's interest as Minister of Public Utilities, and um, we have to work together collectively to ensure that um, TSTT um, cybersecurity is strengthened to the extent that um, it becomes a little bit more resilient to threat actors which operate 24 hours looking to you know, look around our cybersecurity infrastructure and to, to breach people's confidential data. So I am prepared as Minister of Public Utilities to assist the Joint Select Committee if they believe that at this point in time um, I may be of assistance to them. Oh, we also understand that TT Post was also a um, victim of a cyber attack sometime last year. Now, as Minister of Public Utilities, what kind of assurance can you give to persons, especially when it comes to protecting their data and what could be in the hands of those threat actors if, you know, institutions like TT Post, TSCT, those types of institutions are attacked by them? Well, the, the issue of um, cyber attacks you know, is, a, is an issue that is affecting not only us in Trinidad and Tobago, but all around the world governments now faced with this serious um, issue of cyber attacks. Um, digitization and digitalization is something that is a central pillar of the government's developmental program and development plans for Trinidad and Tobago. We need to operate in the cyber space in order to bring governance and government services to our citizens, wherever they may be. But with that comes the threat of um, cyber attacks. Once you start operating in cyberspace, as you must, you cannot escape that. The, there is the, the, the unfortunate threat of um, cyber criminals looking to penetrate um, you know, all of these infrastructure to get access to customers' data and to call for ransoms so that you know, big corporations can pay them ransoms to prevent their data and their personal information from being dumped. Just want to, T um, TN Tech, last year around um, Christmas time, TN Tech was under serious threat by cyber criminals around the world. Luckily in TN Tech's case, they were able to, um, to withstand all of these threats and they were unable to access TN Tech's um, uh, infrastructure. It, it held up really well. So it is happening all over as we speak right now. It continues to happen to TSCT, continues to happen to TT Post, but luckily all of our um, utility agencies have been able to um, put in place the, the necessary security measures to prevent um, customers' data and the data of citizens from being unduly exposed. So we are working closely with the Ministry of Digital Transformation. Luckily, the government has put in place a Ministry of Digital Transformation that is providing tremendous support, not only to us in the utility sector, but to all other agencies of government, the Attorney General's Office, and other various um, governmental departments. The Ministry of Digital Transformation is working towards ensuring that we put in place the necessary infrastructure to prevent and to become more robust in terms of how we protect. The, the data for our citizens. Yeah, I, I know this issue is, I mean, I think it will continue to be in the public domain until, you know, things are, are quite sorted. You know, per, persons are concerned and understand and, and, so. and rightly so. I mean, yeah. you, you're also seeing it in, in, in private enterprises as well, not only in the public sector. And therefore, it means that the government has to continue to invest, you know, tremendous financial resources in providing the necessary security measures to state organizations and state entities to, to build that level of resilience to protect uh, th those agencies from um, threat actors that are operating on a 24-hour basis. Um, TT Post, I can tell you, as well as TSTT, TN Tech, they, they have invested millions of dollars in ensuring that their infrastructure is robust uh, to prevent you know, the possibility and the increasing threat of cyber criminals around the world. All right. Now let's switch over to WASA and I mean the mammoth task that is the restructuring of, of the authority. Well, where are we uh, in terms of the appointment of a new chief executive officer? The, the, the government has made um, and the board of commissioners of WASA 
has made tremendous progress on the issue of the executive transformation of WASA. It has been a mammoth task, if I were to, to, to use your words, because when we got in there, we realized that it was just not about getting a new CEO or new executives, but it's about coming up with a fit-for-purpose organization to ensure that WASA is strategically placed to be able to respond to many of the challenges that face water utility companies, especially climate change, um, the, 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 the use of technology um, in water infrastructure and what have you. So it was indeed a task. We, we, we were able to look back at several attempts over the last 20 years to, to do exactly what we are doing. And what we would have seen is that previous governments, when they were about to make this very difficult decisions, they got cold feet and stayed away from doing so. But you know, we, this government is prepared to take, take on very difficult decisions. And the issue of WASA's restructuring and WASA's transformation is one of the very difficult decisions that the government has to make in the best interest of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It may not be politically attractive to do that, but we cannot continue to, to complain that we need um, a better supply of water. Um, we are not getting the best service from the water utility company. They are not responding as they, they, need, as they should. Um, we cannot continue to just complain and not take the bull by the horn and make the difficult decisions that we must make to ensure that you have a modern water utility company that is managed by a group of executives who have the vision and the resolve to, to undertake the work. That being said, I can advise that the government has approved the hiring of a new executive management for WASA. Uh, and that decision was taken about um, one month ago, where the new executive team was placed before the cabinet. Um, they, you know, they, a very robust and a lengthy recruitment process was engaged over a year ago. And, um, and coming out of that, we were able to assemble a team of about nine or 10 um, executives, including um, a chief executive officer. The matter is before the HRAC to finalize their remuneration packages. And I expect to have um, the HRAC making this decision through the CPO in about three, three weeks' time. And once that is done, the Board of Commissioners will be announcing the new executive management for the Water and Sewage Authority. So then this is a, a, an announcement made first here on, on Delvin Deep. This is the first uh, announcement or public statement that I have made on this matter. Cabinet made that decision a month ago. I deliberately did not say anything because I wanted the other arms of governance to do what they're supposed to do, and the board to put all of their, um, you know, all, all, everything in place to, to, to ensure that we have a smooth transition um, from what we have now into new executive leadership for the Water and Sewage Authority. In addition to that, the board was even mandated to complete the executive restructuring by the end of June. So in addition to new executive management of 10 executives, nine or 10 executives in a month's time, um, the entire executive restructuring should be completed by the end of June. And then we will move to the next phase of the transformation of the organization. That is the management of the organization. But there are other um, things that are happening wise we, we we tackle the, the management aspect of the transformation process, and that would be the number of capital projects that we are, we are ruling out and undertaking to improve the supply of water. But we will go into all of that later into this interview. All right, um, let's talk about the, the water restrictions. Uh, recently, WASA would have announced um, some water restrictions, and it's due to, I mean, the, the weather that we're having and their supply in terms of the dams, etc. cetera. Uh, what, what can you tell us about the restrictions? And then we'll talk about the, the $75 fine for persons caught using their hoses. So let's talk about the restrictions and then we'll talk about the fine. All right. So we have to understand why, why WASA is imposing restrictions on the use of water. 
it is very important to understand why. 60% of Wasser's water comes from streams, intakes, rivers. In the middle of the dry season, the water levels in our rivers and our streams and intake, they drop drastically. And when you have harsh, dry conditions as we have been experiencing at this point in time, which start, started very early in January, 60% of that water, as I've said, that comes from those sources, they are no longer available to the authority. So as we speak today, Wasa does not have 18 million gallons of water that it normally would have in normal rainy season conditions. 18 million gallons of water is quite a lot of water. So therefore, the restrictions are geared towards ensuring that the water that is available to the authority can be equitably distributed as far as possible to all of Wasa's customers, its commercial, industrial, and domestic customers. What is the restriction? The restriction means that if you're accustomed to getting water 24-7, you might start getting water 24-5, five, five days a week, or four days a week. And why? Because that three days that you would no longer be getting water, just by way of an example, that water now has to be redistributed to communities that are not getting a proper service. So it's about managing that dwindling resource as a result of dry season conditions. So that water now has to be redistributed to other communities that for one reason or the other may not have access to water. Most of our water, the surface um, rivers are in northeast Trinidad. As you go into central and, and, and deeper south, or even in West Trinidad, you don't have you know, those large volumes of water that comes from the rainforest and our watersheds in, in, in Northeast. So your distribution, your transmission and distribution network must be tailored in such a way that that water can move from one zone into another zone into another zone to get to the customers that you intend to get that water. But it could have been worse, Ayana. I'll tell you why it could have been worse. Last year, we were able to drill about nine uh, wells, and we constructed two new water production facilities, which added five billion gallons of water to Wasser's um, distribution, transmission and distribution system. Had we not done that, it could have been far worse. It could have been far worse. Those wells and those um, water treatment plants are now providing communities with a reliable supply of water. Lupino is an, a perfect example. Happened to be my constituency. That new water treatment plant was constructed two years ago, producing about 100,000 gallons of water. And the dry season condition today that is impacting so many communities around Trinidad and Tobago is not impacting the people of Lupino because that river source is very resilient and it continues to, to produce 100,000 gallons of water per day. In Upper Parman, it's the same thing. There's a new water source, an intake that was constructed producing 100,000 gallons of water. Luckily, that intake is still producing 100,000 gallons of water. So the people of Upper Parman, um, they have not been unduly impacted by dry season condition. In Freeport, we commissioned three wells, collectively producing one million gallons of water per day uh, and, and benefiting over 23,000 people. Luckily, those wells continue to, to produce the one million gallons of water and the people that are benefiting from the production wells, they have not been impacted. Last year, those people were unduly impacted by seasonal conditions. So the wells that we have drilled in 2023 continue to provide a reliable source of water. They've added 5 million gallons of water for the, um, to the to Wasser's distribution network. And as a result of that, we could have seen far worse, a far worse situation had we not done what we have done. So that's the reason why you have water restrictions. 18 million gallons of water no longer available 
the desalination plants, they have their own um, challenges because the salinity in the water, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge cost for them to treat and they, their production levels have also dropped. So you have 18 and then perhaps 22 million gallons of water no longer being available. So the utility company now has to impose restrictions in the use of hose and all of these devices that can result in the consumption of large volumes of water and perhaps wastage so that we can now save that water to provide our homes, our schools, um, and other you know, um, medical institutions and what have you. We just have to engage in conservation practice as we manage under these very dry, harsh conditions over the next six weeks to two months. Okay. Now, the $75 um, fine for persons caught using devices such as hoses, uh, do you think that's much of a deterrent for persons to really, you know, buy into the conservation aspect of why we, we're imposing this now? It is a, it is a fine that was uh, placed, you know, quite a long time ago in the WASA Act. And like other aspects of the Act, it, it needs to be updated. Uh, I don't think, quite frankly, it is high enough to create that um, uh, deterrent for persons from wasting water. And um, I have noted the announcement made by the executives of WASA that the board um, recently took a decision to approve an increase. What normally happens is that recommendation of the board will be forwarded to the Ministry of Public Utilities and then it goes through the salutary process. It has to be approved by cabinet. But once it, is, uh, it arrives on my desk, I'm going to treat with it and make the appropriate recommendations to cabinet because we have to protect the resources. Um, persons must not, must not see it as the utility company operating with a big stick. Um, it is being unduly harsh on citizens. No. Once we have more water into the system, we get a regular supply of water. But as the availability of water is impacted by seasonal conditions that happen all over the world, then WASA now have to make adjustments to schedule so that we can all manage through the dry season take us comfortably so that we can have, continue to have water in our dams and reservoirs. The worst thing that we would want to happen in this country, the last thing, sorry, that we would want to happen in Trinidad and Tobago is to get up in the morning and read our national newspapers or hear on the television or radio that our reservoirs have gone dry. That will be a national disaster of epic proportion. To get up in the morning and hear your main reservoirs, Karani Arena, Hillsboro, um, um, Navette, uh, there's one in, in, um, in, in East Trinidad. To get up in the morning and hear those reservoirs not being able to produce water is going to create a national security crisis, a health crisis that can destabilize the country. And that is what we are dealing with. So it is better we manage the little that we have to take us through this dry season condition. Another time, to be bawling or going on social media and making all kind of disparaging remarks against the authority. We are managing through difficult circumstances as we have done, as every country in the Caribbean and around the world must be able to grapple with. And once you manage through this, it means that we will have a supply of water so that we can exist. We are sitting here today because we have, despite the, the, the challenges that we've experience and we are experiencing we have some water supply available to us but we don't want to risk that over the next six weeks yeah. now um hollis reservoir is the reservoir in the hollis reservoir in the east that's right so the, 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 the and i did not get that so the reservoir in the east that i was referring to is the hollis reservoir and you know i'm glad that you mentioned that because last year hollis reservoir moved from a daily production capacity of 8 million gallons of water per day to 4 or 3 million gallons of water per day. That's almost my entire constituency. Arima, parts of San Grande, Valencia. Had to grapple with this situation. And because of this experience, from December last year into January, we were able to manage that reservoir in such a way that today, that reservoir is not in a state of crisis. 
And based on the advice that we've received from the Met Office, uh, I am advised that the Hollis Reservoir, because we maintain it and we conserve, it should last us comfortably throughout the, 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 the dry season until the start of the rainy season. And that is an example of what can happen when you engage in conservation practices. Uh, what, what sort of resources uh, is WASA going to expend in ensuring that the, the, the $75 fine and prisons, you know, really adhering to, you know, that, that call for conservation is adhered to? WASA is going to engage in a lot of patrols. I'm going to ask WASA, WASA's internal um, security department to conduct um, patrols around the country to enforce the law so that we can have a fighting chance during this dry season. But in addition to that, I plan to have um, some discussions with my colleague in the cabinet, the Minister of National Security, to get his support from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to support WASA's um, internal police in ensuring that persons comply with the ban. So in addition to WASA's estate police, doing their regular patrols to enforce this law, I intend to summon the, the support of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to work with WASA to ensure that this restriction or those restrictions are adhered to. Because Minister, if you know Trinidad and Tobago people, like I think that you know, yes. you know that we are going to find a way. I know. We're <laughs> going to find creative ways to do it. Oh yeah. But you know, I, I want to take the opportunity to appeal to the good conscience of citizens that when you do that you imperil you know our collective interests and why is yes you might believe that you're paying your bill and the water utility company um, sh sh ought not to regulate the way in which you utilize the water that is it is within wasa's legal remit to do exactly what it is doing uh, we do not have 18 million gallons of water available to us because of the dry season conditions and when all of us engage, or most of us, can engage in conservation practice, it means that all of us can benefit during this dry season. And I'm appealing to all our citizens to not get ahead of ourselves and not be selfish, but do what we must so that we can be protected as a nation. Now, you mentioned booster stations and the commissioning of, of several booster stations in Trinidad last year. Now, there were two booster stations that were commissioned in Tobago this year. So tell us a little bit about the impact of those two booster stations and, you know, what, what, sort, what are you expecting to see now that they have been commissioned and persons finally getting some water in the areas of Tobago? Yes, so the two booster stations um, that were commissioned recently would have been in um, Highlands Road in Tobago, as well as Pine Hill, which is, in, which is located in Palo Tuvio. Uh, these two communities experience an irregular supply of water for years, and that is because the infrastructure in Highlands Road um, has not been upgraded for maybe over 20 years to meet the growing demands of, of, of that community. And on our community water improvement program, we have been ruling out a number of similar types of projects all over the, the country. Because you see, as your demands grow, as more communities come onto the grid, as people build on higher elevation, the old infrastructure certainly uh, was never designed to meet some of those growing and daily challenges. And that's the reason why you're seeing booster stations being constructed all over, is because the, the, these things were supposed to have been done years ago but we're never done. So you can't get the requisite pressure to move water from the lowest points to the highest points. Unfortunately, a lot of us live on hills. So the Highland area, as well as the Pine Hill area in Palo Tuvio, you have a lot of high elevations there. And for years, citizens who live in those communities experience an irregular supply of water because Wasa cannot um, sustain the level of pressures to get water to these communities. The commissioning of those, those two installations um, in Tobago um, about a week ago resulted in an improved supply of water to about 5,300 um, citizens 
who live in the Highlands Road area as well as Palatuvi. And in many instances, um, especially in the Palatuvi area, a number of citizens and, and persons who live there get water for the very first time with new accounts coming into, into Wasso. So it has been very successful. Before the commissioning date, uh, the infrastructure and the facilities were tested. And I would have seen testimonials from citizens who, for the very first time, you know, saw a sustained pressure in getting a supply of water. Of course, we have to encourage them that now that the water is coming with increased pressure, it is not an opportunity to waste or to engage in practices that will result in a wastage of this very important resource. But those people that I interacted with, they've been so happy and they were in tremendous praise for the workers of the Water and Sewage Authority for the work that they have done in um, putting the, these installations together that would have resulted in an improved supply of water. So the two installations would have resulted in an improvement in the supply of water to 5,300 citizens in um, Highlands as well as in Pine Hill or in Palatuvi. And in two weeks from now, we will be going back to Bego to commission three wells that would add approximately 600,000 gallons of water daily to areas in Mary's Hill and Southwest Tobago and some parts of the Hillsborough system, benefiting thousands of people more, perhaps 10 or 12,000 people because of that, um, those new wells that, we, that we've drilled. So um, Tobago is in a very good place because these projects have, have been so impactful in turning, the, turning around the water sector in Tobago. Um, there are areas like, for example, the Quallon River that would fall tremendously in the dry season. That Quallon River is now supplemented by these wells that we have drilled. So even though you are seeing falling levels in the, in the, in the Quallon River, you are also um, seeing that those wells coming into production, augmenting the, the shortfall, and areas in southwest Tobago where you have most of your hotels and guest houses and what have you, they, these people, you know, they continue to have a reliable supply of water. Uh, now, another area in one of the other projects that is in the pipeline, so to say, you know, um, is in Charlotteville. Yes. Um, so there is an area in Charlotteville, again, the high points of Charlotteville, that has been um, experiencing an irregular supply of water. Again, because the water infrastructure was never designed to supply those customers who live on the high elevation. But Charlotteville also has a demand supply deficit of about five or 600,000 gallons of water. So even if you get the water, the infrastructure is not sufficient to get the water to customers who live on the high elevation. So while I was in Tobago uh, a week or two weeks ago, I visited the proposed site for the construction of a small water treatment plant that can produce 500,000 gallons of water, the construction of a major transmission line to get that water that is going to be um, um, sourced from what is called a groundwater, a, um, a saltwater well, because there's no river in, in, or surface water source in that area. So for the very first time, Wasa is going to be engaging in the drilling of a saltwater well and a reverse osmosis plant to treat salted water from the ocean to be able to provide to the people um, that area in, in Charlottesville. A very exciting project. Um, I, I took the opportunity to speak to a number of residents and to, you know, to let them know of the plans that we have to improve their supply and they are all very excited. So I have given instructions to the management of the Tobago team to begin work on this very, very important project. And I'm hoping that next year around this time, we will be commissioning a new plant in Charlottesville that will be able to provide a reliable supply of water to this area. But under the IDB program, I'm, not, I'm hoping that I'm not um, preempting your question. But in addition to that small plant in Charlottesville, the, as we speak, the evaluation of a tender for the construction of a new water treatment plant under the IDB program in Goldsboro, in Tobago. And I am hoping that by June or July of this year, for the latest, 
we will begin the construction of this new freshwater, surface water, uh, water treatment plant in Goldsboro area that will have the capacity to produce 2 million gallons of water for the people of Tobago as well. So it's quite a lot that is happening. The drilling of wells, the upgrading of its infrastructure through the construction of booster stations, the construction of new water treatment plants, um, the deployment of technology and what have you. Um, so Tobago, around this time next year, um, all across the island, they would see a tremendous improvement in their supply of water. But as we speak, based on the results that we have so far, I am advised by the team at Wasa that over 91% of the population in Tobago um, is in receipt of approximately 24-3 and above supply of water, which is a very, very healthy place for the, the citizens who live on the sister island. Yeah. Yeah, and I know Tobagonians are going to hold you to that, right? Yes, of course. They should. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many, or how many persons, um, or how many persons within the population, uh, would you say, as of today's date, uh, receive a twenty-four-seven water supply? This is this is beside the water restrictions that ah, are happening. I was about yeah. to put it in that context. So, before the imposition of the water restriction, which of course is a, a, re a result of the fact that you don't have eighteen million gallons of water. But before that, 61% of the population um, has been in receipt of a 24 7 um, supply of water. This was a significant improvement from three years ago, because I recall on this show, three years ago it was 30 something percent. When I was appointed Minister of Public Utilities, it was 32% of the population getting um, a supply of water of 24 7. But we've been hard at work and um, We've constructed a number of new wells, production facilities, new booster stations, uh, the, the silting of our reservoirs, etc. And, um, and we have seen a consistent improvement in the reliability of the supply of water to many communities around this country. And the scientific data that is available to us is pointing to the fact that approximately 61% of the population in Trinidad and Tobago receive an average of 24-7 supply of water. That's before yes, the dry before season. Yes, the, the dry conditions. season restrictions. And based on the plans that we have in the coming months with the construction of a new um, plant in Goldsboro and in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz, a new plant is going to be constructed there under the IDB program. That plant should be able to produce three or four million gallons of water um, to the people of Santa Cruz, um, San Juan, Tonopuna, St. Joseph and surrounding areas, it means that you, you will now have, or Wasa will now have as a result, three or four million gallons of water from the current water treatment plant that it can now redistribute to communities that are not getting a reliable supply of water. So the construction of that plant in Santa Cruz with the production capa capacity of four million gallons of water per day simply means that you do not have to import 4 million gallons of water from the Karani water treatment plant to get into some of those areas to provide these citizens. So you now have that 4 million gallons of water from the Karani water treatment plant that can be redistributed to other areas that may not have a reliable supply of water. So you have the direct impact from the investment and you have the indirect impact from the investment. So the thousands of people who live in Santa Cruz will benefit directly from that new water treatment plant. But you have other areas in the east-west corridor that will also benefit indirectly um, as a result of the fact that Wasa will now have 4 million gallons of water extra to increase your watershed use. And we are doing that all over the country. We're drilling new wells in the Palo Seco area in, um, in Chatham. Currently, we are drilling three new wells in Granville and Cedras, three new wells in, in Mayaro, a water treatment plant in Maruga, another water treatment plant in um, San Fernando. Once all of these plants come into operation, it means that you are now localizing your support, your, um, your, your source of water, retracting the water from your main production facilities and giving the authority the ability now to redistribute the areas like in Pinal and Ciparia, San Francisco, all of those places um, in woodlands, 
all of those um, places that do not enjoy a reliable supply of water will now benefit indirectly because the water from these major production facilities can now be um, available, will now be available to, 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 to distribute to those areas. And we are already preparing the infrastructure. So in two months' time, there will be major um, pipeline infrastructure will take in place in some of these communities, upgrading the pipeline infrastructure so that it can now accommodate the volume of water to, to, that it's going to receive from these um, um, production facilities to get to the citizens. So it's quite a lot is happening in the water sector. Um, these projects have been designed um, with the customers in mind, understanding the various challenges in the supply zones, and these projects have been designed to be able to respond to those challenges. And it is because of that we, we were able to move from a 24-7 level of coverage um, three years ago from 32% to 61%. And we, we have every reason to believe that once those projects that I've just mentioned come into fruition in the next 12 months, that we will move our 24-7 level of coverage closer to 85% or perhaps even above. Because a number of these communities that I've mentioned here, they, they are experiencing hell um, in terms of their water supply. And we have designed projects and programs to be able to respond to those challenges. Yeah, and 100% comments in a few years, you think? Th those projects, are, they, are, they, they will be rolling out. Some have already started. A lot of these projects are in tender. And um, so in about three months' time, these projects will be kicked off. And I intend to convene a special media launch to, to rule out these, these projects as we go along. Right. Now, sometime uh, between, uh, is it May, May, June last year, uh, your colleague, Minister Stuart Young, was on the show, and he mentioned that TN Tech owes NGC something in the vicinity of five to seven billion dollars. Is TN Tech addressing that, that issue? TN Tech is trying its best to um, liquidate that debt owed to the national gas company. Of course, TN Tech is in no financial position to be able to liquidate that debt on its own with current rates and revenues that it receives as a result of the rates that it has to charge, that it is legally empowered to charge um, by the RIC. So TNTEC would either has to be bailed out by the government to the tune of $4 billion to liquidate our debt, or if the rate that is proposed by the RIC or the rates that have been proposed by the RIC are brought into effect, then it will put TNTEC in a financial position to start liquidating this debt. But as it is right now, if we were to maintain the status quo, it certainly cannot. It is going to bankrupt the organization. It is in no financial position to pay $4 billion to the NGC. It is making incremental payments, but those payments are very insignificant when you take into consideration the mammoth size of that, of that bill. So there are two options available to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Revise the rates to allow the utility company to be able to liquidate it on its own, or get a loan, pay huge interest, and ask the taxpayers of this country to fund this loan. It is a, it is a very difficult undertaking, but it is something that we have to tackle if TNTEC, we, we would allow TNTEC to survive as a utility company. TNTEC has been providing the people of this country with good, reliable service. By and large, it has been meeting its RIC standards, but we do not want to play with fire and to allow TNTEC to be placed in a financial position where it cannot undertake um, its normal operational routine maintenance. And, um, and it obviously will impact the level of service to its customers. So the issue of the rate review is before the, the cabinet, and the cabinet will be making a decision in less than one month's time um, in, in 
providing the necessary policy directions to TNTE with respect to the recommendations of the RIC. So I can tell you that the cabinet has done um, tremendous work in examining and analyzing the recommendations of the RIC. And, um, and very soon we intend to make a finalized policy decision to allow TNTEC to um, collect the appropriate rates from its customers as um, recommended by the RIC. We have to remember the rates as recommended by the RIC are maximum rates. Simply means that TNTEC cannot charge more than what the RIC has approved. But the cabinet can look at what the, the work of the RIC and its recommendation and the potential impact on the various categories of customers and can provide guidance to TNTEC in terms of how it implements the recommendations of the RIC. And that will be done in about a month's time. Now, um, in the ministry as a whole, Public Utilities Ministry, what can we look forward to in the upcoming months? A lot of activities are going to be happening in the utility sector. If a number of projects in the water sector, which includes the transformation of the, the Water and Sewage Authority, obviously that is going to get off the ground finally. A number of projects are going to be rolled out um, around the country as we have done over the last three years. Next month, we will be rolling out or commissioning a operational control center um, in TNTEC, in the Water and Sewage Authority. Um, and what is a, an, an operational control center? It simply means that in a large room with large screens, WASA would be able to monitor all of its infrastructure and would be able to as well uh, control its pumps and its major installation, observe when incidents are happening on a real-time basis so that it can respond almost on a real-time basis to challenges on its transmission and distribution system. For the very first time, WASA will now have at its disposal an operational control center that would allow it to monitor on a real-time basis its entire um, um, infrastructure so that and be able to control a significant component of its infrastructure so that you, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, can see an improvement in the levels of service. So let's move aside from Wasser a bit. The Met Office, next month, you would see, after years of not in operation, the Reader Tower in Brasso Vernado will be returned to full operation. That is going to happen before the end of September before the end of April 2024, next month. So we are going to see the retaining of the full operation of the Reader Tower in Brasso Fernando. But in addition to that, the Met Office is going to turn the sword for the construction of a new state-of-the-art building in Piaco. We intend to do that in about three months' time. And as well, staying at Met Office, the ruling out of a GO16 um, system where the Met Office would be able to utilize technology in support of the Reader Tower in Brasso Fernando so that you can have real time connectivity, real time communication on weather systems coming our way in Trinidad and Tobago so that it can provide real time. Um, weather updates, not only to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, but to our colleagues in the entire Eastern Caribbean. So a lot is happening um, in the Met Office in, uh, on, under the Ministry of Public Utilities. Swim call. We have before Cabinet the Beverage Container Bill, uh, recycling policy, as well as a policy to restructure swim call into a state agency. We expect that to be out of cabinet in a month's time as well. And once that is out of cabinet, we will be moving towards finalizing the draft bill 
for the beverage container deposit refund system in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, a lot is happening with TNTEC, the rate review um, as well. Um, TSTT, you're going to see an, the, the rolling out of a number um, of e-services and the upgrading of TSTT's um, infrastructure as well. TSTT is now financially um, sustainable. And as a result of that, TSTT is also going to be looking to expand its footprint, especially in the rural communities in Trinidad, as well as in Tobago. So 2024 is going to be a very busy year in, in the utility sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Next month, we will be um, commissioning um, ab about 74 new motorcycles for TT Post. All right, I'm going to add 74 new motorcycles to its fleet, as well as 40 um, motor scooters to its fleet, boosting its capacity to be able to provide a reliable mailing service, especially to you know, the folks who live in rural communities. The, the, the new motorcycles and motor scooters will be utilized to boost um, TT Post's um, reach in, in rural communities. So over the next three months, all I can tell the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, look out, you're going to see a lot of activities taking place in the utility sector. All right. Well, I think that's a, a great way to end another exciting episode of, of Delving Deeper this week. So just let me thank Minister Gonzalez for joining us this week on another episode of Delving Deeper. Thank you very much for having me and I look forward to coming back again. Join us at the same time next week for another episode of Delving Deeper. I am Ayana Carter and from the entire crew, have a good night.